And you said recording. I'm going to go ahead and start the recording now, even though we're a minute or two early, just so I don't forget. Hello. Well, let me wait till he's connected. But we have Larry Bounds with us, who is part of the troop uh, for 2023. That's exciting. Hey, Larry. Welcome, Larry. It's nice to have you here. I'll unmute. Hi. Hi. This is Larry. Hello. Hello. Thanks for joining. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So we've got about another minute. So I'm going to hold off and see if we get a few more people coming in. Um, this is a, this feels like a nice, comfortable size group to have a good discussion. That's always nice. And Cora, I uh, was I was actually courting American Cruise Lines to hire me uh, for that cruise. <laughs> They've <laughs> hired me for other things on the Mississippi River. Um, I, I portray John Deere and Herbert Hoover for them, uh, but they have not invited me to the Columbia River yet. Um, one of my favorite programs, I'm stealing my own show a little bit here, is I was hired for the American Horticultural Society's annual conference in Portland. And I got to lead a, a botanical hike as Meriwether Lewis for a group of PhD botanists to discuss the plants that Lewis and Clark discovered or named. Um, I didn't discover anything really um, uh, in the in the Northwest, and it was in downtown Portland. We just like walked out the hotel, across the street into a park, and I did a botanical hike in character as Meriwether Lewis. It was truly one of the highlights of my career so far. So nice, nice. There's more to that story. I'm saving for later. <laughs> Welcome, Lynn. I see Jenny here. I'm not sure I've seen Jenny. Je Welcome, Jenny. Um, if anyone wants to put in the chat um, where you're zooming in from, uh, whether this is your first Ashton Chautauqua book talk, let us know that. Or if you've been to others before, uh, many of you are returning again, and we appreciate that. Um, but let us know where you're coming from so that we know that's the beauty of Zoom is sometimes we've had people from even outside of the United States joining us for the evening. And uh, that's that's one of the beautiful ways that technology makes the world smaller for us. So Ruth's from South Euclid. Welcome, welcome. Let's see. I don't, right now I don't see any more coming. Let's see. Lynn is from Loveland, Ohio. And your second visit. Great, great. I don't see any other people coming in. So we'll keep an eye and, and admit people as they come. But I'll go ahead and get started. Um, oh, Jenny's from Batavia. Um, and Lori Byron is on the Ashton Chautauqua Committee. We have several of the committee members here. So let me go ahead and, and start by introducing them. So I'm Delisa Randall Griffiths and Amy Dobbinspeck and I uh, co-chair the Ashton Chautauqua Committee. But we have uh, Star Dobush and Dorothy Stratton and Barb Slaybaugh and Lori Byron all joining us tonight. Um, it's a, it's a, co a loyal committee of hardworking volunteers that meet on a monthly basis year round, uh, originally just to do the summer events, but now that we have decided that these Zoom book talks are a lot of fun, uh, we, we have more tasks on our plate. We're really glad you're here. And we're really glad that we have had such success with these book talks that we would want to continue them for another year. So this year we have our history's real action figure theme. And we're gonna be doing five book talks with each of the five scholars from starting tonight and then all the way till the end of April. Larry Bounce, who's here with us tonight, he'll finish things off with that final book talk on April 27th, I believe it is. Uh, so we're, we're gonna be, getting you um, educated about these characters, but ho hopefully also intrigued enough that you want to make the journey to Ashland in the summer. And it's July 11th through the 15th, where you come and hear these performers uh, live on the Banshell stage and maybe attend some of the workshops during the week as well. So we're really glad you're here. Uh, we're glad to have our first scholar here. Um, Brian Fox Ellis is uh, joining us this year as the Mary Le Weather Lewis character, but many of you may have had a chance to see him as uh, Audubon 
gosh, was that, that was 2019, I believe he was a part of that troop. Um, so we're really happy to be bringing him back to town. Uh, I will let him fill you in a little more on all the different characters. And, and actually he has a, an exciting new job that he is embarking on at the beginning of the year. I'll let him fill in more of those details, but I'm going to turn things over to him to talk to you a little bit about some background on Lewis and on the expedition and on the journals and things. But please, as as he winds things down, put your questions in the chat and then we will have a discussion. I can um, read those and, and um, Brian can answer them and we can learn even more about the things that you find interesting about this topic. So I'm gonna hand things over to you, Brian. Thank you very much. I am so glad that all of you are here. And uh, uh, I love talking about Meriwether Lewis. So um, I'm glad you're excited to listen. And, and I'll actually just shift one thing Delisa just said. Even now, if any questions come up, anything you're dying to ask Meriwether Lewis or about the research, go ahead and type in questions now or anything I say sparks a question, type it in. And that way we'll have some good questions to start with when I'm done. And what I thought I would do is just give you a little bit of uh, you know, my, my background and what brought me to Lewis and about my research and process. And then I'll read just a short excerpt of the book uh, to kind of start the conversation. Um, so uh, my name is Brian Fox Ellis. My friends call me Fox, consider yourself a friend. I was in a school this afternoon. I'm Mr. Fox to the students at school. Um, and I love saying this, for 43 years, I've been traveling around the world, collecting and telling stories. This has been my major occupation since I was a student at Wilmington College in Wilmington, Ohio. Actually started at Oberlin College. Um, and because Oberlin and Wilmington are both small liberal arts schools in the cornfields of Ohio, where I grew up, um, that uh, both of them have an emphasis on uh, student-led learning. And so I created my own major uh, at Oberlin, it was called The Art of Biology, Approaching the Life Sciences from an Aesthetic Perspective, uh, which led me to Meriwether Lewis. I'll get to that in a minute. And at Wilmington, I was an education major um, focused on science education, but uh, I called it uh, um, whole life education from prenatal development to gerontology. What do we need to know and how do people learn at different stages of their life? And so I did extensive research and published as an undergraduate on uh, learning theory and wrote a couple books of uh, pedagogy and curriculum design later in my career. Um, but even when I was a student, I began literally hitchhiking around the world, uh, collecting and telling stories and helped put myself through college. Took two years off between Oberlin and finishing at Wilmington to uh, travel the United States. Um, Originally, I really started on folklore. I am part Cherokee. I do a lot of uh, Native American stories. I'm Irish. I do a lot of Irish stories. Uh, my mother's mostly German, so I went to Germany and I studied the Grimm's brothers. Um, the first character I became was actually St. Francis. And I went to Assisi, Italy and spent several weeks um, literally walking in the footsteps of a saint, which is a title of one of my newer books. Um, a biography of St. Francis. Um, I slept in the caves where Francis went. And I, I share this with you because I've always loved what I call on the ground research. You know, as a scholar, I spend a lot of time in libraries. I spent a lot of time reading um, and mostly from the horse's mouth, as much as you can go to the source. That's why the book that I recommended this evening is the actual journals of Lewis and Clark. And what I love about this book in particular is it's not just Lewis, not just Clark. It also includes quotes and excerpts from the journals of all of the men who were required to be literate, which was unusual in those days. Um, and again, I'm trained as a science teacher, so I do have this specialization in portraying historical scientists, um, including uh, John James Audubon. Um, one of my, my biographies, I have a series called History in Person. Um, and, uh, and of course, Meriwether Lewis and Charles Darwin and Gregor Mendel and Prince Maximilian. And uh, uh, the newest character is an ornithologist, Robert Ridgway, who was the founder of the National and Illinois Audubon. Um, and I guess one last thing about biography, not only have I published 30 books and 100 magazine articles, but I just took a full-time job with the Illinois Audubon Society 
I've been writing for their magazine for at least 10 years. We were talking about that just earlier today. Um, I think my first article was about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, and, uh, and their editor's ready to retire. So I uh, am being trained and I'm the assistant editor now. And as of January 1st, I'll be the full-time communications director, which will include public programming and performing as Robert Ridgway, John James Audubon, um, I also, during COVID, uh, last little side note, I guess I've already said that, but uh, one more, is during COVID, my world shut down because I normally do 400 performances a year, no exaggeration. I'll do, um, you know, five or seven shows a day is not uncommon. 28 in a week is my record. Um, so 400 shows a year went poof. Uh, the first two weeks of COVID, I lost 200 contracts. And within a month, 400 went away. And so I turned a lot of my shows into books. Um, I have five collections of folklore, uh, foxtails, tree tales, uh, there you go, bird tales, uh, Meriwether Lewis, John James Audubon. Um, and this is the most important part of that, is there was a national debate, appropriately so, about the digital divide, that a lot of small town and rural kids and a lot of inner city kids didn't have access to the internet and they weren't connected to do the virtual learning that we were all forced to do. And I thought, rather than complain, I'm going to jump the digital divide. So I produced about 100 hours of television for PBS, hired my friends. Becky Stone came to Bishop Hill. We filmed five of her characters. Um, I hired some of my friends. I got some grants. I produced uh, 15 books, um, a podcast. So it's available on every platform. If you like paperback, if you want eBooks, if you want to watch it on your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your um, desktop, even over the wire on television, on PBS. Um, so that I produced a hundred hours of curriculum, uh, performances, storytelling, and uh, lesson plans online for students and teachers to use. Um, with the hope that eventually I'll sell enough books, I'll break even. <laughs> um, so uh, it's all out there for free. If you want to, if you want to access that, uh, I have uh, three YouTube channels. And send me an email. I'll send you a bunch of links. Um, but um, all of this is background that leads me directly to Meriwether Lewis. So I consider myself an adventurer. Um, as those who helped to host me last time I was in Ashland, Ohio, every place I go, I try to get out and go canoeing on the Mohican River, go bird watching. Um, I try to live the life of an adventurer. And I had been John James Audubon for a number of years, commissioned by the Audubon Society to portray Audubon. I'd been commissioned by the Field Museum in Chicago to play John Deere, or to play um, uh, Charles Darwin, <laughs> uh, commissioned by John Deere's home in, in Quad Cities to play John Deere. And, and I learned something from Meriwether Lewis that every time you turn around, if you think about it, there's a centennial or bicentennial or sesquicentennial or hepa sesquicentennial. Um, and so I started looking around for what's the next big bicentennial. And lucky for me, I was hired by the um, Iowa Environmental Education Association to keynote their conference, to teach uh, story, science through storytelling, um, did a day-long pre-conference, did some, some public speaking, led some nature hikes. Um, and it was coming up on the bicentennial of Lewis and Clark. And so the very wise educators in Council Bluffs, Iowa, on the Missouri River said, we would like to invite you to be Meriwether Lewis two years before the bicentennial to help our teachers and schools get ready for the bicentennial because they knew it was going to be a big deal. And I had already read a lot of Lewis and Clark, was already a big fan. And so it was a great opportunity for me to dive deep. And it was a combination of from the horse's mouth. And I can't say this enough. If you haven't read the journals of Lewis and Clark, it's one of the best pieces of adventure writing ever published. Um, it's a great work of American literature. If you're just looking at it from a literary perspective, um, they spelled the word mosquito 16 different ways. <laughs> it's a great piece of literature, um, but it's also a great scientific journal. Lewis and Clark, first and foremost, were, it was a scientific expedition hired by Thomas Jefferson to do a scientific survey of the newly acquired uh, Louisiana Purchase. Though it was actually uh, 
started before the Louisiana Purchase came together. Um, Jefferson's imagination wandered up the river um, in the now what we consider sinful idea of manifest destiny. It's ours because we claimed it, irregardless of the millions of people who already live there. Um, but the <laughs> jumping ahead, Lewis and Clark actually had a really great relationship with most of the tribes. There's one troubling story I'll say for this summer. You have to come to hear. Um, but uh, so when I started working on the show, I wasn't working on it as simply, here's a piece of American history. Um, it is a very important piece of American history, but it is also a very important piece of scientific history. Of course, Lewis and Clark discovered nothing. They were exploring territory where a million people or more already lived. Um, but to Lewis's great credit, his mother was an herb doctor. Now I lived with my German grandmother who was an herb doctor. And when I was a boy, my grandma had me weed her garden. And, um, and part of the way she got me to weed her garden was saying, this plant is, is edible, eat all you want. <laughs> and so I literally ate the weeds from her garden. And this one is poisonous. Don't eat that one. And this one is medicine. If you bring it in the kitchen, I'll show you what to do with it. And so some of what I learned from my grandmother, unbeknownst to me as a boy, was actually training that Meriwether Lewis received from his mother. His mother was the local herb doctor. The women of her region came to her with, with female ailments, and she knew which plants were medicine. Um, also, a little bit of biography. I am part Cherokee. I did study with a Chippewa elder for 10 years. I was a formal apprentice. Um, he didn't like the term medicine man, um, but uh, he did teach me traditional American Indian herbal remedies. Um, and so I felt like all of this was preparing me to be Meriwether Lewis. Um, and actually going off on one little tangent here uh, with the journals, and I'll keep coming back to this book. If you haven't read it, uh, it'll be a great thing to, to piece together. And if you look at my bookmarks, um, it's actually something uh, that you can just jump around because, I mean, pick a day, pick a week. At the first year, I read it day by day. Uh, where were they on, you know, uh, what is today, November 14th? In, uh, in 1805, and uh, you can read what they were doing today. And that was a really fun way to get to know them, uh, Lewis and Clark day by day. Um, but one journal was lost. It was buried at the base of the Great Falls. Lewis references this journal in some of the other ones, but it was a separate journal he kept on the American Indian medicinal uses of plants. What if we still had that? I mean, think about the medicines and the leap forward we could have made 100 or 208 years ago now, whatever. Um, uh, the Actually, 218 years ago. Think about the leap we could have made if we had access to that scientific information then. But they, they cached it. They hid it at the base of the Great Falls. And uh, they went on to the Pacific. And when they came back, uh, the river had actually changed course. Uh, they had a they experienced a flash flood at the Great Falls. That's another great story. Um, you'll have to come in the summer to hear. Um, and they couldn't find the scientific instruments, the um, the journals, the items that they had cached or hidden um, at a secret spot at the base of the Great Falls. And now that's all underwater. They built a dam and flooded that portion of the Missouri River, so it'll probably never be found. That's my one little heartbreak with Lewis and Clark. Um, all of this to say that two years before the bicentennial, I was invited and paid, <laughs> I love when I get a commission like that, to dive deep, to do the underground research, to travel much of the route, to read the journals and put together some programs for, I think I ended up doing about 20 shows in one week in the Council Bluffs, Iowa region, uh, a little bit north and south of there and across the river into Omaha. Um, so that is my connection to Lewis and Clark. And uh, with just a couple minutes left, um, since I've become Meriwether Lewis, well, one, uh, one thing that was really troubling is a lot of the characters I portray, like John James Audubon, those who saw me as Audubon, it's a, it's a hand in glove kind of fit. 
I love John James Audubon. I've been bird watching in most of the places that he's been bird watching. I work for the Illinois Audubon Society. I, I mean, just it's like hand in glove. There's a lot. There's a lot that I love about Meriwether Lewis, but there was one thing that was really hard for me. He was manic depressive according to most modern psychologists who don't like to diagnose people unless you meet them. But my wife is a therapist and my wife and I've discussed it at length. And a number of scholars have said, yeah, he probably was bipolar. And if you read his journals, there are days where he is just totally ecstatic, happy, and other days where he's really dark. And even though he ordered the men as the captain, to keep a journal every day, and he hired literate men, I mentioned earlier, that was unusual, hard to find in those days. Every man who was a member of the Corps had to be able to read and write and had to keep a journal. It was part of the official orders from the president, Thomas Jefferson. So again, we not only have Lewis and Clark's journal, we have journals from all of the men. So you can read what five guys thought about the same day, which is really great. There's about a month or two here and there where Lewis wrote nothing. And Clark wrote one phrase, not even a complete sentence. It was something like, Lewis is not himself today. Which some take, again, we're, we're diagnosing somebody who's not in the room, um, was probably his blue period, that he would have these highs and lows. And so I did write a musical theater production with a friend of mine playing Clark, and I was Meriwether Lewis, and I had trouble, and I used to tease myself, I'm the psychotic botanist. Um, Meriwether Lewis and you know Clark was kind of the commander uh, when I wasn't present fully um, but then when Robin Williams passed away um, great tragedy he was a genius I'm a big fan of Robin Williams um, from Mork and Mindy days I've loved Robin Williams Goodwill Hunting still one of the best movies well-deserved Oscar but when he passed away there was this series of retrospective documentaries that talked about his manic depression and suicide and a light bulb went on for me. I'm going to play Meriwether Lewis as Robin Williams on a really good day. <laughs> and as soon as that light bulb came on, it was so easy because there are so many great jokes in here. I mean, when Lewis was up, he was as funny as, as Meriwether Lewis. So during the Bicentennial, I, I actually pioneered a new show that shifted how I do the whole thing. Um, it, I had 10 minutes at the inaugural event in St. Louis and they hired some Native American friends of mine. They hired another friend who plays uh, Sergeant Floyd and I was Meriwether Lewis. And they said, you know, we got six performers, you each get 10 minutes. I'm like, how am I gonna tell this whole story in 10 minutes? So I wrote 10 one minute stories, 10 one liners and I called it the comic misadventures of Lewis and Clark. And once I found that humor, it's all there, it's all there, it's always been there. Once I found it, it changed how I do the show because it is a really fun adventure. They had a great time. They had a party. They danced with the Indians. When Cruzat played the fiddle, Cruzat was a French voyageur, um, all of the Indians and York would dance. Um, so that's kind of how I framed the show. That gives you some background on my connection, some of my research and how I do the show. What I wanna end this little part with is I just wanna read a very short excerpt um, because I always say go to the journals and this is um, my collection and with permission from um, the University of Nebraska which owns the original journals and, uh, and in the lead up to the Bicentennial, they hired Gary um, Moulton, I believe his name was, um, I know it's Gary. Gary's somewhat of a friend of mine. Gary also transcribed the journals of Prince Maximilian, and I'm Prince Maximilian, and I got to hang out with him while he was working on those. Um, Gary gave me permission to, uh, to quote some of the journals, because it's all public domain anyhow, in the back of my book. So I just want to read you a little excerpt about a story with a grizzly bear, talk about my process of turning the journal notes into a performance piece, and then I'll take some questions. This is Meriwether Lewis on April 13th, 1805. The Grizzly Bear, Ursus Arctus Horribilis. Remember that name, Horribilis. We found a number of carcasses of the buffalo lying along the shore, which had been drowned by falling through the ice in winter and lodged on shore by the high water when the river broke up about the first of the month. So again, it's April, 1805. 
along the river shore and about the carcasses of the buffalo on which they feed, we saw many tracks of the white bear of enormous size. We have not yet as yet seen one of those animals, though their tracks are so abundant and recent. The men, as well as ourselves, are anxious to meet some of these bears. The Indians give us a very formidable account of the strength and ferocity of this animal, which they never dare to attack, but in parties of six, eight, or ten persons, and are even then frequently defeated with a loss of one or more of their party. The savages attack this animal with their bows and arrows and the indifferent guns with which the traders furnish them. With these, they shoot with such uncertainty and so short a distance that unless shot through head or heart, the wound is not mortal. They frequently miss their aim and they fall a sacrifice to the bear. <laughs> Just pause and think about that. I'm going bear hunting and the bear is going to eat me. <laughs> This animal is said more frequently to attack a man on meeting with him than to flee from him. When the Indians are about to go in quest of the white bear, previous to their departure, they paint themselves and perform all those superstitious rites commonly observed when they're about to make war upon a neighboring nation. So Lewis actually wrote about two pages of warning in his journal that the Mandan and Hadatsa said, when we go hunting the bear, you know, it's always eight or 10 men. We paint our faces as though going to war. Um, and then at the end, and I don't actually have the rest because it was a much longer passage. At the end of these two pages, he basically erases it all with one flippant comment. He says, but the grizzly bear has not met a Kentucky long rifle. Hmm. And then he goes on and... Uh, you know, it would take too much time to read them all. Um, and he, he tells several stories about encounters with grizzly bear where eight or 10 Americans, you know, part of the Corps went to hunt a grizzly bear with disastrous results. And in one time, Lewis by himself encountered a grizzly bear and was nearly eaten. If not for his dog, um, he may not have survived to tell the tale. And then at the end of about eight of these stories, he writes in the journal, I think the men's curiosity about the yellow-haired bear has been thoroughly satiated. <laughs> it's great material. It's just such great material. It made it so easy to put together this show. The problem is I literally could go on for a couple of hours with stories because it's it's several years of adventure and every day was another story. And, and every day, several men wrote what happened in their journals. And so it's really good to see them from those different points of view. And um, I will answer questions. Um, and please, um, I know that we have a couple of questions that were already kind of sent in. Um, and I'll let Delisa read them in the chat. Any questions about grizzly bears, about their discoveries, about the journals, about my research and my process? Go ahead, I'll just hit the pause button for a moment. Let everyone type in a question while you're Yeah, thinking. add your questions in. And I'm, I am gonna start with, uh, Dorothy Stratton sent us a few ahead of time. She's always wonderful about that. I wanna start with, I can't tell how much of it was the commission and how much of it you had choice, but why Lewis and not Clark? Um, <laughs> that's a really good question. Uh, well, I was not formally commissioned to play either of them. I was just invited to the schools to talk about Lewis and Clark, but I fell into Lewis more so because he was a botanist, because of those connections I talked about earlier, that my grandma was an old um, kind of European herb doctor and Lewis's mother was an herb doctor. And I studied with a, a Chippewa herbalist um, and I've always been fascinated with Native American herbal remedies. Um, so I, I like both, and I'll admit he's the commander, <laughs> but also that, uh, that Lewis was the more the scientist of the expedition. And, and that's the part that, that did fit for me, um, hand in glove. Whenever I pick a character, I want somebody who fits. The only thing that was uncomfortable, I guess, um, was the hat uh, because, and I still haven't found a really great hat when I'm Lewis. I always buy a new hat when I write a new show. Um, I have a good one, um, but I think maybe before the summer I need to buy a new one, um, is, is his mental distress. Cause I am a very ha happy, go lucky, upbeat person. And I, I have trouble with his blue periods. 
Um, and so that, that was the hard part. But uh, why Lewis instead of Clark? And, and I guess two short phrases. I like being the commander. <laughs> and uh, and, and the, he's more the scientist would be the short, the short part of that. So what else well, do you want to do? Yeah, let me follow up with, with a couple of other ones that she said. I think you've addressed part of this, but maybe you have more to say. Of what can you tell about each man's personality through those journal entries? I know you've talked about the bipolar possibilities, but what else um, do you know? Well, that's a great thing about the journals is you have to know, you have to assume, I can't be sure, but somewhere in the back of their mind, they know this is a public document that they're writing for the president under the orders. They're writing for Lewis, who commanded them. Um, but when you write in your journal in your tent at night, when you're summarizing your day, when you're, you know, you're actually digesting the experience. You're reflective. It's, it's the nature of the beast that a journal is a place to think a little more deeply, to pause and consider. So I would like to say that the journals are a great way to get to know the character. And you do see um, Lewis's you know, ecstatic days. There's so many great quotes um, about just how thrilled he was and how excited he was. Um, and Clark is more officious. Clark is the military man. Clark was actually Lewis's commander earlier in Lewis's career when they were in Ohio. Um, that, uh, 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 George Rogers Clark, who is William Clark's older brother, um, captured what became the Northwest Territory, Ohio, and what became Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and um, Wisconsin, the Northwest Territory. Um, George Rogers Clark won two battles in the American Revolution that doubled the size of our nation. And what I love about it is no one died. These are two battles where George Rogers Clark outfoxed the British hair buyer, Harrison, based in Detroit, or Detroit at the time, double the size of the country. And so George Rogers Clark's little brother, William Clark, was a commander in Ohio um, around the time of Tecumseh and, uh, and the Prophet and uh, Little Turtle and Blue Jack and all those famous Ohio stories. I grew up in Ohio. I know these stories. Um, and Meriwether Lewis was like some underling. He, I think he was an officer, but he was like a uh, corporal what's just below a sergeant uh and and he actually got into some trouble and clark got him out of trouble and lewis remembered that and so when lewis was president jefferson's personal secretary um and jefferson said you need a co-commander in case something happens to you he immediately invited clark to be his co-commander um but back to your question is you read those journals and you see those relationships and you really get to know the dynamics between the officers, between the enlisted men. You see the respect they had for Sergeant Floyd and Gass. Um, you see the, uh, the uh, I forget the name of the one private who was called out and they actually did a public whipping in front of the Lakota who thought it was barbarous and inhuman, even though running the gauntlet was part of their tradition. Um, and, and so you see those relationships, you see that, and it's all in the journals. Um, Again, I, I'll, I'll say it multiple times. Uh, this is the book we're basing tonight on. And you, if you haven't read it yet, uh, check it out at your library. And it is it is a great read. It is funny. And it's, it, it's something you could sit down and read straight through because it's a gripping story. It's an epic adventure. But it's also just fun to flip in and say, uh, what were they doing today? I just happened to open to November of 1805. Um, we're a few days off. Today's the uh, 15th, is it? 17th. Oh, I'm lost a few friends. I don't have many to lose. <laughs> so November 17th, it was a fair, cool morning coming from a uh, wind coming from the east. At half past 10, Captain Clark returned, having traversed Haley Bay to Cape Disappointment. <laughs> so they're at Cape Disappointment uh, 218 years ago. So Other you... Questions? Or what else? Are there yes. other, are there, oh, wait, wait, I see one in the chat. What's the youngest yep. audience you perform for and what do you do to capture their attention? Thanks, Ruth. That's, that's a great question, Ruth. Um, that's something else I love about both, um, you know, uh, Meriwether Lewis 
and John James Audubon is they are scientists and I can get into really great technical detail. And I often perform for a room of PhD ornithologist as Audubon or PhD botanist as Meriwether Lewis. But because they're adventure stories, I've done both of these shows for kindergartners. And I love a family audience where I can get in some complicated ideas for the adults and the kids rise to the moment. And I can have some really silly, fun adventures for the kids and the adults let loose and laugh. And it's it's really great. So with both of these characters, I think kindergarten is the youngest. Um, though there are little snippets of stories um, I have told to preschoolers. Um, my, the other thing, I, you know, when I was at Wilmington, I was actually a, I was torn between high school biology or preschool literacy. And so I, I did work at a daycare center in Toledo, Ohio for uh, uh, about a semester. Um, so that's, that's Ruth, set you on a good trajectory for what you do now. I would yes, say yes. that whole, whole gamut. But it is about adapting the story for the audience and knowing your audience and uh, whether it's, you know, like this audience, which I'm guessing uh, based on the names and faces is relatively well educated, uh, you know, rather complex thinkers. Um, and not that you dumb it down for kids, you still include all that complex science, but you just have to add a few more explanatory clauses and define your terms, but don't uh, shy away from the complex vocabulary or they'll never learn those words. So um, keep adding those questions into the chat because um, we, we have plenty of time, but I have other questions I can ask until you're ready to put some in there. Um, I'm going to ask one more question about Lewis and Clark, and then I'm going to shift because Dorothy brought up some really good ones about the relationship with the Native Americans. But um, you were talking about he's the commander, but she asked, um, it seems that Lewis and Clark were effective co-leaders, but how did they work out who would be in charge of what, or did one dominate overall? Um, that's actually a really complicated question maybe unbeknownst to her, um, because on paper and in reality, and in the eyes of the men, it's three different answers. So Thomas Jefferson, who is ultimately the commander in chief as president of the United States, ordered Lewis to have a co-commander. When they first set out, it was a secret mission because the Louisiana Purchase hadn't happened yet. It wasn't even really being talked about. Um, and they were going into enemy territory. And so they had to get secret approval from Congress and Congress would not authorize Clark's commission as co-commander. So technically on paper, Lewis was in charge and Clark was his underling, even though earlier in their career that had been reversed. Clark was the commander and Lewis was the underling. But Lewis and Clark had a secret agreement that in the eyes of the men, they were full and equal commanders. And if anything happened to one of them, the other one was in charge. And that was a secret handshake that the two of them knew about. But your question is actually a little more nuanced than that. Um, and I will say that, uh, you know, Clark was the kind of more natural commander of men. That Clark, um, and it was a military expedition. It was commissioned by the US military. Once the Lewis and Clark, or once the Louisiana Purchase went through, it became public knowledge and they were officially commissioned by Congress and given a really small budget of $2,000, they overspent of course. Um, so Clark was the more natural, like keeping the guys in line, the disciplinarian, here's your orders for the day. And Lewis was more the dreamer. Lewis was a scientist. Lewis was in charge of the collecting of things. Um, one of the things that blows my mind, and uh, this by itself is, is you know, an hour long story. Lewis studied with the best scientific minds in, in, in Philadelphia before they left. Thomas Jefferson helped to found the American or the Philadelphia Philosophical Society. The Philadelphia Philosophical Society is still in existence. You can go to their offices. They house some of the original Lewis and Clark findings. When I was there to do research, they were closed for repairs. <laughs> I'm such a geek though. I found the back door and I found that some of their collection is at a small university in Philadelphia. And I got to go through the actual botany, the, the plants that Lewis collected and wrote the little tags 
um, for the bicentennial. They got a small grant to re to clean up the collection. That's a that's a big tangent. So Lewis was much more in charge of the scientific collection. He trained with the best scientists, but he delegated well. He knew that if he's focusing on plants and animals and soils and and collecting study skins and skeletons and all the things a scientist does, he couldn't do all of that. So he teaches Clark how to use a sextant and a compass and a pocket watch to take the uh, altitude, latitude, uh, longitude at high noon every day. And Clark, who had never drawn a map before, grew one of the most accurate maps ever drawn in world history. It's 4,000 miles long, and it is less than four miles off. That's 0.1%. And I would argue, and other scholars would agree with me, because it's not entirely my idea, but I do put forth the argument that he's off by four miles only because the Missouri River changes regularly. Um, it is the most accurate map ever drawn. And Clark, every day, because Clark was the more organized one, Lewis recognized that in him, assigned him the responsibility of using the sextant high noon, um, using a watch and, and, uh, and a compass to figure out and plot where they were in relationship to where they were yesterday. And something you alluded to earlier, so this is hopefully a fruitful, fruitful tangent for everybody, um, their respect of American Indian knowledge and wisdom, they get teased for today. Like I heard one native woman, friend of mine, say uh, they are just a couple of white dudes who were lost and, and refused to ask for directions. <laughs> they discovered nothing. Well, I would argue that they did stop and ask for directions. And Clark in his journal even made notes about American Indian map techniques. Um, I don't see anybody wearing hats. You might want to put your hands on your head. You ready? I'm going to blow your mind. Um, we measure distance in miles, or do we? When you tell your friend where you're going, do you talk about miles or how many hours to drive there? Or how long a walk it is? The American Indian maps they would say, oh, you'll find the Rocky Mountains, the Great Shiny Mountains, um, in seven sleeps. So it takes you seven days to get there. Now, how far you travel depends in part on the terrain. If you're crossing flat prairie, you can cover a lot of miles in seven sleeps. But if you're getting into the foothills, then how much you travel each day decreases. Clark made note of those kinds of things as he was drawing his map because of his respect, just as Lewis made note on the indigenous American Indian uses of plants out of their respect, and also kept a vocabulary list of their names for birds and things like that. Acknowledging he didn't discover birds, he gave them Western scientific names, or he brought back study skins that somebody else named, like Lewis's woodpecker and Clark's nutcracker, but he actually wrote down some of the Native American names. Um, there's actually another book I think I have here, yes. Um, uh, after our talk the other day, Delisa, um, this is Lewis and Clark, Legacy, Memories, and New Perspectives. Lewis and Clark, if, you, if you're someone who's visual, that's what the cover looks like. This is about 20 essays, mostly written by American Indians um, and American Indian historians and American Indian scholars who give you 20 different perspectives on Lewis and Clark, hence the subtitle, Legacies, Memories, and New Perspectives. Um, and there's some really great material in there as well. That, challenges us to rethink what were Lewis and Clark actually doing, not just the myth mythology. That's why I love the title of this, Real American Superheroes. You know, this is not just mythology. These are real people who did superhuman things. So and incidentally, for those of you on the Zoom, we're going to send a follow-up email tomorrow and we're going to include um books that uh Brian has recommended, but then we'll we'll put that one on there too. Um, so that if any of this intrigues you and you want to go look further, uh, we'll make sure you have that information. We're talking about books, just two other real quick ones. It has not come up in a question yet, but please type in those questions. Um, there's, there is a book that was published around the Bicentennial, Plants of the Lewis and Clark Collection. Um, and I don't think this one is one of the best written books. Um, it, it's a little dry. It's more just a series of short scientific uh, commentaries. Um, uh, but it's very well researched and I, I am glad that I have it and I was able to look up and, and learn some stuff. And it does have some gorgeous photographs 
and the author did travel the course. So the book uh, does somewhat chronologically and geographically um, list where the plants were discovered. And uh, I'll go off on one other little tangent related to that. Um, when Lewis and Clark came back, a lot of their collection was dispersed. Um, much of it was given to Jefferson as an official government documents. Some of it went to a museum in Philadelphia that burned down. Um, some of it later was sold and traded. And a big chunk of the herbarium, the botanical specimens, were actually sold to a buyer from London, and they ended up at Kew Gardens in London, which is one of the world's great collections of the world's botany and dozens of, of botanical explorers from all over the world ship stuff back to Kew, including Charles Darwin, who I portray. Darwin's mentor was the botanist at Kew Gardens at the time. Well, an American just happened to be in London, a relatively wealthy American, curious about science, and saw that Kew Gardens had some of the collection and saw that some of it went up for sale and negotiated at auction to buy the complete set and ship it back to America. So it's only been relatively recently that much of the Lewis and Clark herbarium um, was discovered, reclaimed, came into one housing at a university in Philadelphia. I did a show as Mary Weather Lewis, someone in the audience said, I work with that collection, would you like to see it? Every nerd's dream. I went the next morning, I spent four hours actually leafing through, all bad puns intended, the actual herbarium uh, that Lewis and Clark discovered. That's what you know on the ground research means. I could read in his handwriting the little notes about where he found it, when he found it, what he just how he described it and then you know this book was a great resource then to go back and say so here's the modern scientific name here's the uh the description and the other thing i do like about this book is there is a quote from the journal the day that lewis found the plant um so it's it's a really nice piece of scholarship even if it isn't the drama and humor um and uh, I see a few more typings in the chat. Is there another question there? There, there isn't another question, um, okay. but but people are really enjoying what you're talking about. So you're doing well. If, if anyone would feel more comfortable unmuting their mic, small enough crowd, yeah. A question, you would be more than welcome to do that. Um, we we use the chat, but not everybody is as comfortable with the chat feature. So please please let us know if you want to ask a question that way. Am I well, unmuted now? You are, yes, Ruth. You are. Yes. I never know. <laughs> anyway, you go down to reactions and click on raise your hand um, if you're not familiar with that Zoom. I don't see the hand. So it's a okay. oh, reaction. Yeah, yeah, I see the reaction. Yeah. Click on reactions, click on raise your hand, and then Delise knows to call on you. Okay. Um, well, let me lower you're okay. This is the real hand. Hi, so, Ruth. What's your question? Um, no, I was just curious if you've read um, Unsheltered by Barbara Kingsolver, where she talks about um, Mary Treat, who was a colleague of Charles Darwin. Mary Treat was a, she was in Vineland, New Jersey, which isn't far from Philadelphia. Do you know uh, three that? things. Um, uh, I worship the ground Barbara Kingsolver walks on. I have read everything she has written that I know of, though I just found out last weekend, my wife and I have a bed and breakfast and we host a book lovers weekend about five times a year. And people come and they spend the whole weekend in their jammies and just talk about books. I love it. Oh, but man. we had a book lover last weekend who says she has a new book out that I haven't read yet. Yeah, I uh, read it already. Yeah. Uh, what is it called again? Uh, Demon Copper Field. Oh. Copper. Yeah, it's, it's okay. based on David... Uh, on Dickens books, David. Yes. Okay. So well, I, I, I'll, I'll have to get that. But, um, but yes, I love Unsheltered. And uh, the second thing is, um, um, uh, not only am I familiar with that woman, Mary Treat, um, but I do play Charles Darwin. And um, I'm sure Barbara Singh Kingsolver, I, I have not talked to her about this but I would, I would put $100 on the table. Um, she knows that there is a project that was for the bicentennial of Charles Darwin and the Field Museum commissioned me to be Darwin for the bicentennial. But there was a project that came up at that time called the Darwin Letter Project and it's ongoing. But there was major funding from the British Royal Society, which Darwin was the secretary of, 
to collect all of Darwin's letters and letters to and from other scientists. So if you just Google the Darwin Letter Project, it's infinitely searchable. You can actually find the letters from Mary Treat to Darwin and Darwin's responses. Um, And uh, I'm just, I just love that Barbara Kingsolver does that kind of research. She has that kind of scholarship at her core. And the character of Mary Treat is, from what I've read, very accurately drawn. She was a woman ahead of her time. She was a brilliant female scientist. And actually, uh, if you'll pause for just a second here, where did you go? Um, I'm in my library at my office. You can still hear me. Um, Just out of reach. Here it is. So I also portray Charles Darwin's college drinking buddy, <laughs> Benjamin Dunn Walsh. They weren't roommates at Cambridge, but they were good friends. And, and we have the letters that Benjamin Dunn Walsh sent to Darwin and Darwin back. Walsh lived in my backyard. I'm in Bishop Hill, Illinois, Northwest uh, Illinois. And literally when I'm on my back porch, I can see a windmill. We have a wind f- farm near us. And that windmill that I see from my backyard is in Benjamin Dunn Walsh's yard. Walsh was the editor of American Entomologist. And and these are three Walsh letters that I quote when I perform as Benjamin Dunn Walsh, um, the American Entomologist. And I found articles by Mary Treat. This is a a first edition, original, like 1860s and 70s um, scientific journal on American entomology. Um, And so your question just, Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> it's a short answer. Do I know Mary Treat? Um, I, I, what little I know about her, I worship her almost as much as Barbara Kingsolver. So well, apparently, there's a museum in Vineland that she stumbled on, and that's where she found all the information about Mary Treat. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah. Well, that was actually my next question to you: is um, why do you ask? What's your fascination with Mary Treat? I mean, just from the book, you know, because that, you know, I've got, I loved Unsheltered so much, and I've listened to her talk about it so many times on mm. YouTube that uh-huh. you know, the relationship between her and Darwin, but also between her and the fake biology teacher, you know, from the yeah. that time period. Yeah. So I would encourage you to look at the Darwin letter projects. Um, okay. They're very easy to Google and just type in her name and boom, you'll have actual letters. Star I'll actually to interrupt. I yeah. just want to know if it's the Darwin Correspondence Project. Oh, yes. Thank you. I have it and I did drop it in the chat, but I'll also add it to the follow-up account. Yes. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, great, great, great. great. Um, there you go, Darwin Project, yep. Are there other other people who have questions? I'd like to get back to uh, a whole different topic that Dorothy asked about because Brian and I were talking about it a little bit right before we started tonight and he was saying the thing about hands-on learning so she asked can you describe for us the p I had to get pronunciation approval here um, that were used on the trip uh, were they like big canoes or were they like barges or something else so I'm going to let you talk about all of that yeah, so it's usually spelled P-I-R-O-G-U-E. Pierogi is how you want to say it, but that's a Polish uh, uh, savory pastry. <laughs> well, it can be sweet, but it's usually savory. Um, so it, it, it's a French term, piro is uh, how they say it in New Orleans. Um, and they are fascinating boats. It's actually an American Indian design. Um, I live in Illinois currently. I'm on the Edwards River in uh, uh, what was... Uh, uh, Potawatomi territory. Um, prior to that, um, the Illiniwik, the state is named for. Prior to that, we have the Mississippian, um, the uh, Hopewell Adena, and uh, uh, Hokia Mounds was Mississippian. Actually, some of the same mound builders who live in, in Ohio. Um, I know very near Ashland is Turtle Mound that I explored as a boy. Um, and uh, I grew up in Ohio, so you have mound builders there. So the mound builders in Ohio made the same kind of boat that the French then later named the Piro. And it turns out the design is uh, been, you know, shared around the world. But we know that the native people in Ohio were making them 2000 years ago. Matter of fact, recently, 
we had record drought. Um, Ohio, Illinois, Mississippi rivers are all lower than ever. But recently, the water was so low, they found a 2000 year old Piro where the Spoon River, famous in poetry, joins the Illinois River, um, literally a stone's throw from one of the best American Indian museums in the Midwest, Dixon Mounds. And basically what Lewis and Clark did, and they describe it in the journals, they even have some sketches. They learn this from the native people. It's usually basswood, um, which grows in the floodplain and is a very light wood and easy to work with, uh, easy to carve. So you chop down the tree and uh, what the native people would do is they'd actually set fire to the top, scrape away the charcoal, put the fire back, scrape away the charcoal, put the fire back, scrape away the charcoal, and they would use fire to kind of hollow out the log. And her question is, you know, were they small or, or large freight? They could be as big as the tree. And so often they were made as like a small canoe for two people, like a modern canoe. Um, but just as often, if it was a troop, um, you could make a big one. And Lewis and Clark made a few big ones. Um, you get a big basswood log that's, you know, if everyone just reached out your arms and as big as you could hug a tree, um, you could get five or 10 people and lots of gear. Um, and the biggest ones could be, you know, 30 or 40 feet long with five or 10 people and half a ton of cargo. Um, so they could be really large. Um, you know, with metal tools, uh, I have a friend who makes them and I did a study with him. I was trying to hire him to come and make me one. <laughs> and I would donate it to the museum, but I get to use it whenever I want. <laughs> Um, and get some Boy Scouts to do the labor because it is a lot of work. With, with modern, they use metal tools like a, an all uh, uh, hoe uh, adds, I think is what that one tool is called. So an ad, you could like chop away wood to hollow it out a little faster with metal tools. But the native people have been making them for thousands of years and Lewis and Clark learned that from the native people. But they did also uh, bring French voyageurs and that was key. So they were a military corps with about 20 U.S. troops, but they also, um, especially the first year going up the Missouri River, they had about 30 uh, French voyageurs. They sent a lot of those back down with the cargo after the first winter at Mandan, and then they took about 15 with them all the way to the Pacific and back. And the French knew the river, they could read the river, they knew boats, and they were like the navigators, um, even though they were on rivers that Europeans had never traveled before. I'm curious, I have a question. Um, I, I know you really like exploring the real places of your characters. How much of their journey have you traveled? Well, I love my job, if I haven't said that often enough. I got hired to do a lot of the bicentennial stuff. I couldn't take two years off and go the whole way there and back. You know, um, I have a couple of friends who did big chunks of it, but I, you know, th those were all volunteers. They didn't get paid. This is my job. I put kids through college. I paid a mortgage. But even before they got to St. Louis, I did some programming on the Ohio River in Paducah, Kentucky and Metropolis. Um, and so I've traveled most of the route in chunks. So I got hired to go to the Missouri River stretch uh, near Omaha and Council Bluffs two years before, the story I already told. I got hired to go to St. Louis and St. Charles, Missouri um, for the kickoff um, before they went. Um, one of my favorite gigs, um, when Lewis and Clark, the reenactors, arrived at Fort Mandan, the North Dakota Reading Teachers Conference hired me to come out for a week. And I keynoted the Reading Teachers Conference. Um, I brought my friend who plays Clark and we did a they rented a small theater. In, and so we did the musical uh, theater version of Lewis and Clark with me as Lewis and my friend as Clark. Um, and then I got to go to Sakakawea's village and, uh, and do some programming um, at Fort Mandan. And then later, because it took Lewis and Clark a while, um, I did get hired by the um, American Botanical Society, I mentioned earlier, to go to um, uh, Fort Disappointment and uh, to the um, Pacific coast and spend some time in the Columbia River Gorge um, because it's what I do. I keynoted the conference, I led some hikes. And then on my own, I spent a couple of days just kayaking the Columbia River Gorge with a good friend of mine who lives up there. 
So I, I've not done 100%, but I've done big chunks of every section is the short That was my guess. Yeah. Yes. Hey, yeah. a really good question from Larry Bounds. So how are Lewis and Clark celebrated as superheroes on their return? Well, that's a great question, Larry, because the truth is everybody thought they were dead. <laughs> you know, Lewis, right before he left, he writes a letter to his mom saying, I'll be gone for maybe a year. How long did it take? <laughs> when they didn't come back after two years, they were just written off. When they showed up in St. Louis, people were like, who are you? Oh, oh, oh. And then, you know, they were applauded in the press. They were paraded. They were the toast of the town. You know, St. Louis was extremely ecstatic to have them back because the wealth of St. Louis from that time on was built on the back of their discoveries. Most of the men who are members of the Corps were given um, $2 a month for her pay for a couple of years, but they were also given property in the West. And many of them became the leaders of the Western fur trade. So Astoria Hotel, Astoria Bank, that all rings a bell. Astoria hired some of these guys to lead um, ragtag bunch of fur trappers into the mountains uh, to plummet the West for beaver and otter pelts. Um, and so the work that Lewis and Clark did uh, became the foundation for the wealth of St. Louis. And St. Louis saw that. It was like if you discovered or invented a microchip and you're going to take your town into the tech era, Lewis and Clark were those guys. Um, and uh, and then when they got back to Washington, they were the toast of the town. And because, you know, the, the Louisiana Purchase had gone through, here's the scientific evidence about how rich the soil is, the plant resources. Again, this was a scientific exploration. So all the data they collected, investors knew the West was worth um, the investment. I mean, Jefferson paid three cents an acre. Of course, it was twice the federal budget and put us in bankruptcy, but it, it was three cents an acre. Um, and considering what we, we've since reaped from that, that bountiful harvest, um, Larry, they were very much uh, superheroes in the eyes. Sadly, Lewis didn't have a, a happy ending, um, but Clark did ride that the rest of his career and uh, had a couple of positions of uh, relative wealth and power for a, a gentleman at that time. So. Ed has a question for you. Um, are there journals of the men who were sent back on the return trip after the first year? Yes, I believe so. And it's the University of Nebraska, um, and it's all online. Um, so uh, again, I like paper and I keep holding up this book, um, the journals of Lewis and Clark. Uh, Bernard DeVoto, a uh, typical college professor thing, he had his graduate students comb through all of the journals and pick out their favorites. And then uh, uh, Bernard DeVoto skimmed through those and edited this for the centennial. So this book is about 100 years old, um, but is republished for the bicentennial. And in my opinion, is the best summation of the journals. But I think if you buy the complete set um, in leather bound version, it's you know, $1,000, um, or it's all free online. Um, University of Nebraska Press has made that all available, thanks in large part to the scholarship of Gary Moulton, who went through and edited um, every man's journal. So you can read some of the journals of those guys who went the first, though most of them were French, um, and they were not hired as military men, so it was not required that they were literate. And so there's not as much depth there, but I do remember reading some of that. Um, but it's a long time ago, so I might be uh, unclear in my memory. Um, there's a little, I'm sure, but probably not the same depth as the military men. Okay. Are there any other questions? This has been so enriching on so many levels, actually, uh, but it does make me really excited for July 11th to come. I don't want to rush time, but I'm excited for <laughs> July 11th because this is going to be a really, really interesting performance, I'm sure. Um, so for those of you who can make it to Ashland and you think of the other questions that you didn't ask tonight, well, you can come and ask them to uh, Meriwether himself and you know, find or out. Or come to the coffee and uh, conversation the next morning, which is one of That's my favorite right. parts. 
That's um, right. And let's right. throw out two ideas before we let you go. Last time I was there as Audubon, I led a bird hike of the cemetery, which I thought was very well received. And I like bird watching. Um, I also lead hikes as Meriwether Lewis. Um, quick show of hands if you want to wave or hit the uh, raise your hand. Who would be interested in going on a botany hike with Meriwether Lewis? Um, and a uh, little further afield, and we might have some logistical issues. Um, I have canoed most of the rivers in Ohio. I grew up in Toledo, went to college at Oberlin and Wilmington. Um, the Mohican River in your backyard is really one of the prettiest rivers in the in the Midwest. And last year when I was there, or three years ago, when, when I was there as Audubon, I just went out on my own. Um, who would be interested in doing a little bit of a guided canoe trip on the Mohican one morning? Um, maybe we can make that as a bonus option while I'm there. I have a kayak, but I also have a yeah. little person. So we'll have to see how it all rolls. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have several committee members here that are hearing these ideas being thrown out. So <laughs> I know it's outside the bounds of what you normally do. And I'm happy to do a more formal lecture workshop kind of thing. But uh, the great. best way to understand Lewis and Clark is to get in a boat for two years. <laughs> Or at least two hours. <laughs> so I just want to check. I see hands up. Are these hands up saying, yes, I want to do these things? Or does anyone have a question? I think um, so kayaking. So I, I, I did have that question about the sexual relations with oh, the yes. Indians. Yes, yes. <laughs> I missed yeah, that. Do you want me to let me read that one? Where yeah, I, I was just curious. It was oh, just yeah. so, so offhanded in the journal that I, I just wondered if there was more of a story there. So it, she said on page 90, Clark writes in March of 1805 that the Corps of Discovery men have venereal complaints they caught from the Indians at Fort Mandan. Mandan. Um, my Dan, what is the story about the men's relationships with the Native people and the attitudes of Lewis and Clark about this happening? And what did the Native men and the Native leaders think about this fraternizing? Well, first, um, you have to take away all of your European Victorian uh, ideas about sex. Um, Native cultures, uh, each culture has their own attitude and slightly different perspective, but it is very different from ours. Um, I mean, for example, um, I have a non-binary child who uh, is very much involved in the Anishinaabe uh, protest about the oil pipelines illegally coming through the reservations. And there's actually a special camp of what we would call LGBTQ Native people who are, in my opinion, most effective about stopping the pipeline. Um, Native culture has this really great, deep respect for people who are non-binary, because you're not limited as male or female, masculine or feminine, you are the best of both. And so with some of these ideas in mind, um, the native culture has a very different perspective on sexual relationships. They're not so Victorian. That um, it was common that when guests came, a young woman would come into your lodge to keep you warm and comfortable, if that was your preference, or a young man would come in. And if you're a troop of men traveling in the wilderness for a long time, there's no record in the journals about homosexual relationships, or are they? There actually are a few subtle references. Um, George Druyere is somebody who was not a journal keeper, but the other men wrote uh, allusions about George Druyere's preferences. Um, he was half Shawnee and half French. Um, all of this to say that it varied culture to culture, tribe to tribe, but it was very common for them to have a uh, guest in their lodge at night. Um, and actually one of the little um, uh, tongue in cheek jokes the men allude to, they never spell it out, um, is York, uh, who was Clark's slave um, and that's a whole nother set of stories. If you get a chance, I have a friend who plays York and it's a genius, brilliant performance. Um, he lives in Kentucky, not too far from you. Um, Is but, this Hassan? Uh, yes. Oh, we've already had him as one of our, isn't one he of our great? Characters. Yeah. Yes. 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 
So because he's speaking to a modern American audience, Hassan is really good about watching his vocabulary, but I think he makes a not so subtle illusion about how the American Indians were really excited about this huge, strong, powerful man that he had magic and all the women wanted to bear his children. <laughs> and so there are no doubt if we did the genetics, probably, you know, a dozen offspring of York scattered across the West because, uh, they really admired what he brought to uh, to their village. So, you know, it's it's funny. I'm I'm blushing just thinking about it and talking about it. Um, but your question is a good one because, um, again, um, you know, I, I've hung out with a lot of native people. I'm part Cherokee. I've been to a lot of powwows. There's a different cultural perspective that you know, raised as a white middle class middle American Methodist was at first a little outside my comfort zone. But uh, it's it. I don't know if I answered your question specifically, but the short answer is yes, there were relations and yes, uh, it was often encouraged by the native uh, people, so. I knew it would be an interesting question and a little <laughs> interesting answer. <laughs> Actually, a different character I portray, Prince Maximilian, um, his journals are also right here, also transcribed by Gary Moulton. Um, that's where I really got to know him is he was working on Prince Maximilian's journals when I was researching the character. So I went to the, um, uh, the museum in, in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, the Joslin, and I got into their archive and into their collection. Um, again, it's not spelled out, but Prince Maximilian as a European prince was like the eighth son. Uh, he never married. He had a manservant who was more than a manservant. And he wrote admiringly about the Mandan. He actually met Charbonneau, Sacagawea's uh, partner, spouse. It, it's a complicated relationship. Um, uh, and he wrote admirably about the non-binary, uh, they, they used a French term, Berdash, uh, uh, people uh, among the Mandan, said that they were the most beautiful people he had ever met and that they had great respect for the non-binary uh, members of their tribe. So he wrote about it more openly and in more detail, was actually one of the first European scholars to write about Native American relations and how their ethic was different from the Judeo-Christian Victorian English perspective. Are there other questions? We've, we've covered quite the gamut tonight, haven't we? But I guess that's very fitting for this adventurer character, isn't yes. it? Yes, a couple yeah. of miles. Yeah, yeah. Well, we are so glad that you all joined us tonight. Um, and do come back. We don't have anything in December, but it will be um, January 12th. Karen Varanch will um, talk about a book about Jackie Cochran, which is her character, an aviator. Uh, Right here. And then we'll have another one in February. Becky Stone will talk about a, a book that was written by uh, Polly Murray. And then in March 23rd, it'll be a book. Um, Joey's doing Samuel Bellamy, and there's no one book about Bellamy, but it's a book about pirates in general where Bellamy is a part of the story. So you'll get a, a bigger picture of the pirate um, world, I guess. And then Larry's going to uh, finish things off April 27th with us um, on Harry Houdini. So all you need to do is uh, go to our website and sign up through Eventbrite for each of these events and you'll get uh, the link. And we really would love to have you um, share this with your friends. If, if you found it interesting and you know someone that you think would like this too, please let people know, send them to our website. We are just ashlandchautauqua.org. Um, so we're pretty easy to find. Even if you just Google Ashland Chautauqua, uh, it'll come up. And Star put the website link right there in the chat if you want to use that too. So we'll follow up on the books. Uh, some of those books are available. Uh, the ones that Brian's written are available on Amazon. So we'll follow up with a list tomorrow. And if you get uh, some of my books, send me an email. I'll send you a link to the video because I filmed them all as well for PBS. Okay. Okay. So we could put um, we could put your email in the follow-up um, message tomorrow too. Okay. We can do that too. Um, let's see. I lost my train of thought. Oh, the survey. You should get a survey that will pop up as you leave tonight. Uh, if that doesn't work, 
We'll also send the survey link in the follow-up email tomorrow. We would appreciate um, if you could help us gather data so that we can say, you know, here are the people we reached, here are the, the regions they come from. That's why zip codes are really helpful for us with uh, grant organizations so that we can talk about the breadth of, of what our programming is doing. So we appreciate you. We appreciate you coming and we hope to see everyone back in January to hear Karen Varanch talk about her book. Thank you everyone and have a good evening. And thank you, Brian. I think I'm if maybe I need to end this so that you get that survey. Good night.